Okay, so I started already. I apologize there. I promise like to take more English lessons there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're doing anyway, fine. So can you see now my screen, Fernanda? Mark, can you confirm that you can see my screen? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So really I was missing a lot like to be with our dear community and members. Uh, the last time that we were together was on the 14th of uh, December. So a month approximately. So really happy like to be here. Today we have a special webinar with Sandra Guerra, uh, Geha uh, in Brazil. She's based in Brazil. Mark will make the proper introduction, but today we're gonna talk about the opening the black box, how to mitigate obstacles to efficient board decision-making. And not commercial here, but uh, I mentioned this to Sandra actually today that I bought her book as well. So I don't know if you can see uh, like my screen, but I have my physical book here with me. Anyways, uh, I'm gonna move uh, here just like to really wishing you a happy new year. It's a big uh, year for VAB. We have many uh, good plans in terms of expansion, but also in terms of delivering a better experience to over 250 members in 40 countries, right? All of you received a letter from the founders and we can resend it in case that you didn't receive it uh, with the presentation and our plans for this year. Uh, for those people that are new, our approach is uh, to be connecting, learning and networking, right? And not really a recruiting agency. And this is how we have built this community over the past uh, 19 months. And this is the worldwide representation at the moment. Good news is that we're expanding now to Asia and to uh, Australia. I'm gonna mention in the next, uh, in one of the next slides. But before that, meet our new members. So welcome to Gilles in Croatia, Hem in Bath in, in the United Kingdom, uh, Luke uh, Tomasino in France, Sandor in LA, and Ralph that is actually uh, going in our strategy to expand our horizons in Asia Pacific. And a quick uh, just reminder over resources, I'm gonna send it the link uh, of the link tree we rebuilt, uh, and right now, if you enter to the link tree, you can find absolutely everything about VAB, the events, <laughs> webinars, the podcast, all in one place. And it's now with a new structure. So I hope that all of you, you can bookmark this so you can get better understanding of what is going on with VAB. Two huge highlights, right? The first one, we are launching VAB in Asia. 15th of February is the official date. We're gonna have Michael Chin, who is the president of Heineken uh, in Taiwan. Ben Nolan from Shaparency and Mark Fleur uh, from Sydney. And we are officially launching VAB Asia. So if you are interested, you work in the region, you live in the region, or you have colleagues and friends, please join us in this special meeting. And the second one is our event. We are heading to Israel. We know that we are in a challenging times. Uh, I'm already like looking for my flights, but we will be there in Israel from the 30th of March to the 3rd of April. Nirit, are you in the call there? Not sure if Nirit could make it, but I don't think so. Just like to mention, we are going to close the subscriptions until next week. Already confirm a uh, full uh, one 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 boss with forty YPOers, and we have around like ten VAB members confirmed, and uh, some others about like to come uh, in the next days. Quick messages here: VAB podcast is available, right? We have Christoph Solkas in our first episode officially. Uh, it is in Spotify uh, already. We can share this with you as well with our beloved uh, Andrea Iorio, who is the moderator in the VAB session, right? So you can uh, have a look on that. January events, we have Shefali and Mark talking with the community and our partners of Team for Hair, 18th of January about international boards. Faye, who is in the call, she will be transmitting from Beirut and she will talk about communication inside the boardroom as well on uh, the Thursday. And then in January still, we have two VAB Connect sessions with Gary and with John Rose. This is on a Friday. And on the 28th, we will have how uh, you can get better skills and tips and tricks to become a better advisor in 2022 with drop follows. And finally, get uh, tuned because we are gonna uh, announce some new changes regarding the VAB communities concept. We are passing this to the advisory board groups uh, and this is still like a work in progress with the leaders that I will be reaching is still at the uh, beginning of this week. So thank you very much. And now over to you, Mark, so we can go with Sandra, please. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, Shefali just pointed out, I think that's on the 18th of January, um, the, the Him for Her event. So look, please uh, sign up if that's of interest to you. Uh, hey, Cecile, nice to see you join. Uh, wonderful to see everybody today. 
I'm delighted to welcome our special guest, Sandra. Sandra is an expert board member with a 26 year career in the boardroom, the founder of the Brazilian Governance Institute and the owner of Better Governance. And what a topic we have today. I'm sure there'll be loads of questions. Let's intrude VAB style, keep it as interactive as possible. So David will be manning the chat. Um, so we'll have lots of questions, I'm sure, for Sandra. And again, huge thanks to everybody for, for making this first call of the year. As David said, loads of exciting things going on, uh, which we'll be taking you guys through over the coming weeks. Um, but for the moment, over to you, Sandra. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will be stopping my, my screen and, and just like super quick, but uh, at the end, we're gonna, uh, for those that are interested, like to buy the book that Sandra uh, launched in the English version, there is a 20 plus discount, okay, uh, from the editorial. Thank you and welcome again, Sandra Guerra. Uh, thank you, David and Mark. It's a, a great pleasure to be with such a, a special audience today, all board of directors. So we are among peers today uh, discussing our challenges and our opportunities here. So uh, let me start uh, saying that I want to tackle today uh, three elements here, the bounded rationality and the biases and how they play together. Uh, I'm going to show to you that dynamic in the board really matters. And also uh, the topic of this chat, which is mitigating obstacles to efficient uh, board decision. So uh, we depart from the uh, concept that even boards made up of the most competent, diligent, and committed uh, directors can fail disastrously. And why is that? And here I bring the concept of a bounded rationality, which is a com uh, concept that, you know, uh, Herbert Simon won a Nobel Prize uh, for that. Uh, we think that as humans, our decisions are always uh, rational. But uh, Herbert Simon told us that our rationality is bounded and bounded by limited knowledge, uh, bounded by the process of uh, we, you know, dealing with the information, the time for decision making, we normally would make decisions under time pressure, and because of cognitive limitation. And that's the elements that I'm going to cover now. Uh, we, uh, as humans, are, uh, we have a uh, we, we have the, the issues of having cognitive bias in an individual manner. And in my book, you're going to find uh, a taxonomy of those biases that I use from a scholar in six categories. Uh, I'm going to just mention some of the examples here because I want to focus the biggest part of our uh, talk today on uh, the mitigation of such biases. So memory bias is the one that we uh, certainly believe that we remember all the elements of certain uh, facts, for instance. And there are lots of studies that show that, of course, memory fades through time, although we are not necessarily aware of that. So we take decisions based on our memory instead of based on actual facts. Statistical bias, even statisticians are, uh, you know, vulnerable to this sort of, this, uh, of these biases because eventually may uh, consider, for instance, if I ask you, uh, if I say to you, uh, John is a very shy person uh, and, 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 and very, you know, uh, very dedicated professional. Uh, does he work in a library or does he work in a bank? Every time that I pose these questions, the answer is he works in a library because the audience has been framed in the concept of chai that I mentioned. And with that, everyone forgets that there are much more banks than libraries in, in a certain region. Uh, the, the example is U.S., so the sample is totally forgotten because you got framed in this idea of, uh, you know, of John being shy. 
So uh, there are many individual uh, biases that we are subject to, but uh, group dynamics are added uh, to this individual bias, making uh, the board even uh, more dysfunctional and getting apart from rationality. So, and these are uh, five uh, uh, group biases. You are familiar with her defect, even in an individual manner, but this happens in the board. When you have the expert in the board, you tend to follow the expert because you don't have that many information as the expert. So instead of making your, your judgment and understanding and study the topic, uh, there is this tendency of following uh, the one that shows more expertise, knowledge, or, which is even more uh, uh, problematic, power. Group thinking, we are all familiar. Uh, always when you have too much, uh, you know, uh, uh, conformity, when you have people thinking the same, coming from the same background, uh, with, from the same gender, region, et cetera, age, uh, group thinking uh, tends to be present. Uh, false consensus, uh, it happens a lot when uh, you have particularly strong leaders, uh, when uh, the leader uh, leads the conversation thinking there is a consensus, there is no one expressing otherwise a different vision. So uh, it's not a consensus, but it's a false consensus. In group fa favoritism is when uh, the tendency to support the opinions that coming from directors or executives in rejecting suggestions coming from outsiders. And it's kind of related with the fifth one, self-serving, which tends to attribute success to internal factors and a failure to the uh, external ones. Uh, the behavioral approach shows that then directors uh, can be uh, hijacked by the, those bias that I've just uh, mentioned. And we are human beings are all subject and vulnerable to these biases, although we not necessarily admit it uh, uh, this possibility, and this is part of uh, the issue here. So why am I proposing uh, the behavioral approach? And let me make a pause here to say that I've been involved with corporate governance for 26 years. I've been a director for 26 years. And as a founder of the Brazilian Institute of Corporate Governance, we, we were studying and making policies and proposing mechanisms since for more than two decades. And as time was passing, I realized that even we were working on better codes, training, better regulation, better laws, uh, always we, 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 we reached a, a situation like, well, and now happened again a problem. This happened, for instance, in the beginning of the millennia when the corporate scandals uh, in, in many regions, but particularly in the US, uh, everybody asked where were the board, what the board was doing that was not paying attention to that. So regulation were, were transformed, it's more uh, strict, uh, best practices, training, whatever. And then 2008, again, the global financial crisis happened. And again, uh, the question was what the boards were doing that were not paying attention to that. So a uh, puzzle is that I try to understand other reasons that could be uh, pay, uh, playing a role in governance. And that's why I started researching the behavioral approach. And throughout the years, I have been also making research on that. And now I'm, you know, my instinct was, uh, uh, was right when uh, we found in a research that dynamic uh, on boards really matters. And let me share with you some of the preliminary results of this research. The research is still ongoing. I'm doing now a follow-up of this research. We found, my co-authors and I, a composite, as we call this academically, uh, which 
with uh, higher scores in board dynamics, uh, board directors would typically experience higher comfort to disagree, level of free debate, information sharing among directors, and trust between board and executives. In the other side of this composite, uh, directors would experience lower resistance to outside ideas, propensity to reject new ideas, propensity to refrain from expressing different opinions, social loafing, which is the concept that in group, we minimize our individual our efforts. And this was experienced uh, more than a century ago. And tension during meetings should be also uh, lower. So when you have these nine factors, and these were nine questions in our questionnaire, when we put this all together, we find that this board dynamics with these characteristics would lead to uh, a, a better performance perceived by the directors. Of course, in social sciences, we always research perception, not the fact per se. Uh, so these higher scores on, on board directors would, as I said, uh, uh, lead to better uh, results, perceived results in higher creativity innovation in the board, the overall performance, and satisfaction with board decisions. But let's, let's see what leads to good board outcomes. So the board overall background diversity, and I'm not talking here about di gender diversity only, but we are talking here particularly in this element that we found, the background diversity, different experience, different background, uh, different, different careers and so on. The use of mechanisms to increase decision alternatives. And I, I'm gonna cover this in detail when we get to the mechanisms to mitigate the obstacles to efficient decision-making. And just to give an example, Premorton, Devil's Advocate, and, and some others that I'm going to cover. Sufficient time to make decisions, so not taking decisions under pressure. Uh, directors will pre prepare to make decisions. This seems obvious, but we, we found the correlation very clear, and uh, the correlation is, was really is strong. What does not lead at all to good uh, board outcomes? The board is stuck in habitual routines. And this expression is used in academics to say that the board uses the same agenda all the time. Start by looking the results of the last period, and then the CFO make a presentation on the financial statement and, and, and so on. So instead of reaching the topic, tackling the topics that are more important or more crucial or the, the needs a different approach instead of the routine that the board has. Uh, so this is one, one of the elements that, that prevent a good decision-making um, environment. Meeting takes place under time pressure, and, and this is uh, obvious. And fatigue on meetings contributes to hasty decisions. Guys, I'm certain that all of you have been in boards and in a certain time, mostly near 5 p.m., you, you feel that everyone starts to packing, arranging, because they have a flight to take, well, in the times that we had uh, in-person meetings. Uh, of course, this you know, pressure to take the plane, to leave the room, it's in the air. So you were not, you were in another mood taking decision. And this is what this is about. So I said that this is the uh, research that we are doing now, a follow one. It was responded by 340 directors around the world. I'm going to ask uh, David to share the link of the research in uh, the chat. Uh, good. Thank you so much, David. And I would invite you to respond this follow-up questionnaire. And when you put your email there, you're going to receive updates as soon as we have another data treatment uh, to, you know, um, to increase the number of respondents. And also because in this follow-up 
questionnaire, we are also tackling uh, the, you know, the pandemic to see if there is any difference from the previous period that uh, the, the research was done before uh, the pandemic. So the main part of our conversation today, how to mitigate the obstacles to efficient uh, board decision making. So uh, the proposition of the book is precisely to offer a guide to navigate through these uh, uh, behavioral issues and transform the board interactions to become more productive and more uh, effective. So I'm going to start with some of the elements. Uh, I call the red alert uh, button. Every time, and I'm certain that you guys have experienced uh, this many times, every time that the executives come to the board and say, you know, I'm sorry we didn't send the material um, with, you know, we sent the material only yesterday because this is a very pressure issue. We are in a negotiation and we have until tomorrow to participate or not in that beat. I'm certain that all you guys have faced situations similar to that. And, and this, I would suggest uh, that this would trigger the red alert uh, uh, button because uh, this is the pressure of time that can divert directors from the, the rationality. Another point that requires that, you know, this red alert is a certain, um, um, uh, tone of skepticism or uh, care or aware that, you know, there are many elements that you have to consider, you will not have time to consider. And, and it's not only about pressure of time, I would say that complexity also should trigger the red alert. So uh, statements like, no, we have all under control, it's very simple. And then you really don't believe it's as simple as it's being presented. Uh, the other point is what I call the signatory power. I mean, uh, management needs board approval to proceed with certain transactions, for instance. Uh, and at some point, the only way you can, you know, uh, get in, 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 a, in a depth analysis of the situation is not providing your signature in those uh, in that topic that is being under under analysis for a time of course for for a window of time so uh, and with that try to limit this rushed approach to uh, to decision making uh, when I talk about innovation uh, we are talking here about being open. Uh, to new ideas, to new thinking. So uh, the concept of uh, being the board and the directors and all the environment being able to discuss, okay, we are, we are being presented of a situation, but what if certain elements of this proposition do not happen? What if a, new, uh, a newcomer uh, comes to be a competitor of us. What if, so it's really challenge the thinking of the board and management and open space for uh, the new. Uh, we all know that not necessarily the boards used to do that, but sometimes under pressure, like we had in the pandemic a period that we are still facing, boards were, let's say, uh, uh, driven to uh, push to, to this situation where they have to reinvent many times the business to survive. So the proposition is do not expect for a crisis to do so, but do so uh, in a regular basis. Uh, choice architecture is an element uh, very important that has been studied for some time, particularly in the you know, public setting. Uh, let me give an example of a choice architecture or the concept of nudge in a school cafeteria. You would put you know, vegetables and the good food in the eye and the very near to students to prefer to choose this uh, food, this uh, 
the things instead of you know uh, the food that is not as healthy as broccoli, carrot, or whatever. So this is considered a nudge. I mean, you you are not taking uh, out of your choice. You're gonna do at the end. You have all liberty to do the choice, but you have you receive a small nudge to go in a direction that it's considered to be healthy to you. This concept of choice architecture can be transported to the boards. Uh, and we are gonna cover some of elements, some nudges that boards can use uh, to, to do so. Um, one, one element is ensuring that there is time enough uh, to leave to co uncertainty to, to coexist with the decision. Uh, my experience is that the boards have a pressure to reach a closure all the time. It seems that a kind of anxiety. And many times uh, in boards, I, I propose, uh, okay, let's, let's stay 15 minutes without, without saying what do we think about it. Let's live 15 minutes working with uncertainty, proposing questions, what if questions, exploring doubts, but not saying, uh, conducting, not trying to reach a closure, not saying, I think that, I don't think, I agree, I don't agree. And my experience is all the time, boards could be very uncomfortable with that. It seems that, you know, uh, of course, the final goal is to reach a decision, but the, my proposition in here is let's live with uncertainty. Let's uh, give room to uncertainty for a period where you can explore further all the elements considered and, and then you can uh, reach uh, a decision uh, in a more robust manner. And let me give you some examples of how to do that, some mechanisms that the board could use to do that. First, to increase the number of alternatives and also be sure that the management use also these ideas. Sometimes you receive in a, in a proposition of acquisition, for instance, one acquisition, one proposal. So how many, how many cases were analyzed to reach that the, 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 the conclusion that this one acquisition is the one that we should examine at this point, right? So decision trees, checklists is, uh, so they are mean, means to uh, you know, increase the number of alternatives and to be sure that you are considered a, a good sample of the universe that you have to analyze. Another uh, mechanism, and, and this one is used to uh, maintain a certain skepticism from the board is the use of devil advocate that, as you know, was created in the Vatican. Uh, so uh, normally uh, it, it's very important to choose the correct person to play this devil advocate. Sometimes can, can be an outsider because the, the role should be credible, right? So an outsider would be a, a good person to do that. So to really challenge the proposition and challenge the current thinking and to bring other perspectives and, and so on. Another one is the pre-mortem. And I like pretty much this exercise when it's done individually. So the chair, it's presented all the, uh, you know, the proposal for a transaction and the board, the chair of the board says, okay, let's take 10 minutes individually. Every one of us, we take a piece of paper and we write down <clears throat> what could go wrong with this transaction, right? What could go wrong? And individually, uh, everyone, uh, write down what would be, uh, you know, the issues, the problems that can occur and why. Uh, and then you have the papers, eventually you don't have, you know, the uh, signature of each one. So everyone is very free to extern, uh, to express uh, his or her ideas. 
So this is also an exercise of skepticism and also you bring perspectives that would be silent otherwise. It will not be expressed because, you know, imagine I'm a, I'm a new person in the board and I'm just arriving, I'm three, three months uh, in this board. You guys know everything about the company, about the business. I'm outside of this industry, by the way. But I have a strong uh, perception on certain elements that eventually I would not express because I'm very new. This will not be my case, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it can happen. So this sort of exercise helps to bring all the visions uh, inside. Uh, now, uh, psychology safety is paramount to be sure that you have a real uh, free debate in the board. So that the directors uh, take risks, share and challenge ideas. And of course, uh, the chair has a very important role in ensuring that this uh, happens. And I, I've been, I mean, as I do board evaluation, as in my other, my other life as a consultant, I do board evaluations all the time. Uh, so I see the difference when there is a board that can really discuss in front of the owners of the company when there are controlling owners, challenging their ideas and so on, how this is, you know, uh, much more constructive and conducive to, to good decision making. Uh, so with that, and because I want to be sure that I give enough time to your questions that I see that is already coming in the chat, uh, here, I leave with you an invitation to dive in this efficient board decision making. I gave some examples, but uh, the, the whole story is uh, presented in, in my book. The, the book has a very practical approach. I, of course, I share my experience of 26 years experience on board. I add to that the academic and market research, some as I just show you. Uh, uh, I presented three different surveys in the book, and I work with cases, with real life, board real life. I, I made 31 interviews around the world for, for three, three, four years. So I, I open each chapter with a caselet, as I call The caselet was, you know, uh, transformed to not be recognizable. Uh, but it's a story, like a, like a novel, you, you're going to see the characters, what is happening, and then I stop the case, I cover the concept, and then at the end of the chapter, mostly, I would finish the case with the conclusion uh, of this. So this is, this is the book, The Black Box of Governance. Was, the first one was in Portuguese in 2017, and this one was launched uh, September last year in English. And with that, I finished and I'm ready to tackle uh, the questions, but I, I give the floor to David to handle. Um, how do you want to proceed? Excellent, thank you. I think, uh, I, 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 and really congratulations for this. I'm gonna send also the link of, of the book for those that you are interested. Uh, many people reach me to create a direct contact to you. So please, those that are interested, uh, let me know and I will make the introduction. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions there. Shefali, maybe if we want to start with you and from there I have the list of people uh, so you can interact directly. Shefali, with you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was really interesting and insightful. Uh, I have a research interest in decision-making per se, so I look at things from that lens all the time. My question is essentially about the slide you finished on. You said efficient board decision making. One of the smaller areas of research, as you will know, in the functioning of boards says that the more diversity there is, the less efficient board decision making is, but it is potentially more effective. So I'm keen to find out if you uh, could comment on the difference between efficient and effective board decision making, particularly in case of uh, you know, with the background of diversity of opinions and experiences and so on across uh, along the uh, board table, 
but in any other context that you might have drawn that distinction because our job is to be effective. And uh, if you only have to be efficient, we will probably compromise and optimize on the decisions we have to make. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and very good, uh, very good question. Uh, you know, uh, we are talking here about when you have more diverse ideas, of course, you need more time to discuss the idea. And uh, so it's like the conflict. There is an optimal level of conflict in a board. No conflict at all is not good. Too much conflict, which is called by the, uh, the academics, negative conflict is not good as well. So you have to have a level of conflict that is uh, conducive uh, you know, to effective uh, decision-making. Uh, so I think that uh, you know, the efficiency of decision-making comes uh, also, uh, and it's also related to the process that you use in the board. So you can have the level of diversity, you can have different perspectives, you should have different perspectives to have a very effective decision making, but you can be efficient in how to do so. Let me give you an example. Uh, most, many boards uh, use a lot of time to executives presenting the topic to the board. So long PowerPoint presentations. This is not efficient. So the proposition is that all the material, the, the pre-reading material should satisfy the board in regards to the information. And during the meeting, you would have two, three, five slides only to set the scene. Uh, and then you use that time to discuss. So I think that you, know, you can have if, uh, effective decision-making with a certain level of efficiency if you take care of the process. And of course, you have to uh, have, um, I don't see decisions to be effective if you don't have diversity uh, of thinking approach that comes from certain characteristics as age, geography, gender, and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, and actually, Shefali is, is one of, the, of our members that requests like to, to be contacted directly to you. Now over to you, Luke Tomasino, that actually uh, you joined our community yesterday, so welcome to VAB. Luke, do you mind to interact directly, please? Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, thank you for the presentation. Very informative. Lots of ideas running through my mind. I'm not on a board yet. Um, I've uh, My history has been working uh, as a hired gun for private equity firms in a very operational role. And a, I'm looking and aspiring to join a board in a non-executive role. And some opportunities have been popping up. So I've been very curious to learn about board membership. Um, I'm not sure, David, did you want me to ask a question or? Yeah, 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 please. Like, do you have already, uh, or you mentioned that, what was the social loafing reference that occurred? Yeah, um, yes, you mentioned earlier um, the social loafing. I, I think I get the concept, but you mentioned something that happened a century ago that we, we know, but I don't know what you were referencing. So what happened a century ago? <laughs> it was the concept was tested by. Oh, OK. Uh, the, and the concept was tested in the, the following manner. Uh, they put two people uh, in a, with a rope making the effort, you know, to put the rope in a side or the other. They uh -huh. measure the effort of these two individuals. Then they put a group of people maintaining the same individuals, and they measure again the effort that these two individuals are putting into the task. And in the group, this very same two individuals decrease the effort that they were doing. So in group, possibly because you are not perceived uh, individually, you reduce your efforts. So a century ago was this finding this experiment that you know uh, prove that this happens. Interesting. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Um, that's very interesting uh, results. Thank you. And and look, that's why. So what do you do with that in a board? 
So you, you were sure that you were assigned certain roles to individual board directors, when I mean chairing a committee, being sure that, you know, as you are the expert in our group in a certain topic, uh, the board uh, as a whole assign you to be sure that you bring all the updates that you hear uh, in the industry about that specific topic and so on. So to be sure that you are not hidden among the group, doing not, nothing or doing less that you you should. So that, yeah, so that you're uh, maintaining your total commitment uh, to fulfill what's expected of you and what you're yeah. capable of providing, right? Because you would be individually seen, visible. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine? Do you mind uh, to ask, I think you were uh, discussing about like how a new board member can behave like inside the boardroom. Do you mind to interact with Sandra, please? Catherine? Okay, the, the question from Catherine was like, if you have any recommendation for a new member joining a board lacking the diversity and how best to navigate expert egos and some of the biases mentioned. A uh, very good question, Catherine. And, and by the way, um, I, I'm starting a, a training program here in Brazil on soft skills for board directors with another expert in mediation. So I bring the knowledge on boards and she brings uh, the mediation on the skills needed in, in mediation, which is can be used on board. So uh, if you're uh, joining such a board, you are the first one to be diverse from the, the whole group. Uh, it's not um, necessarily, uh, you, you should very take care with the way you act and the way you propose questions. So if you start your participation on the board with a kind of acidic or an approach, a critical approach saying, uh, you know, I don't know why you guys are doing this for so long. You were doing the wrong, uh, wrong thing. So uh, quite open questions, exploring. Uh, can I learn more? I, I'm not sure that I've been understanding uh, this issue or that element. So the idea is that in the very, first of all, depending how you get to the board, if there is, for instance, an, um, in a listed company, a contested ele election or such that you are being uh, 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 nominated by minority shareholders, for instance, your simple arrival will be seen as a certain, you know, is a certain way of, she's, she's not part of us, right? So you already, this frame, this hollow effect as a, um, is already there. So you should act in a way that counteract this uh, previous perception or this pre concept pre prejudice. So in quest open questions, exploring. So not discussing and not, um, not, not putting the issue me and you, but you know, this element that you are discussing, I would like to understand what, why, what I'm not seeing that you see in the benefits of this uh, proposition. And so I think this is the way, not only to newcomers to the board, but to all board members, but it's crucial to newcomers to be you know, received. And through time, <clears throat> uh, you will uh, show and express how you contribute to the board until they perceive your possible contribution to the board, they possibly will not hear you as you should. This happens to me many times. Uh, I'm for many, many, in many, many situations, I was the only one different from uh, the group. And I was for many times the only woman in the board. So, and it takes time for your competences and your knowledge to be a knowledge. Um, so it requires this, you know, the use of soft skills to be sure that you start interacting in a positive manner with the board and the management. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Konstantinos, uh, do you mind? I don't mind at all. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, congratulations. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. Uh, my question is a little bit off from what we discussed, but I think it ties to, to two things. You mentioned uh, the importance of psychological safety within the environment of the board, and also uh, the fact that better boards uh, embrace you know, uh, disagreement or at least uh, an open discussion, uh, debate, and, uh, and, and of course there is a high level of trust. But in my experience, a big part of that is the role of the chairman and you know, the messages he conveys. So in a situation where the chairman of the board is more consensus oriented and less open to that you know, uh, environment of, of, uh, of debate and, and you know, mulling over the topics and looking at different points of view and rather breezing through and uh, towards a decision, what options or what approaches you would recommend someone sitting on a board has. And I know walking away is always an option. So let's put that aside and, and, and let's explore others. You know, Constantinos, there is a case of uh, precisely responding to your question on a book that was given to me by a French director. And, and he was not the chair, he was an independent director and he started to approach the chair out of the meetings uh, in a very constructive manner. Uh, trying to explore why uh, things should be done in a different manner uh, and showing not menacing, uh, because if this would be done during the meetings, a person like that, and he was a kind of a di dictator, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. the person would be menaced and would uh, the opposite, the reaction would be opposite. He would be even worse in mm -hmm. his behavior. So uh, one important uh, point is to have this outside um, of the meeting conversation with the chair and maybe with some other directors uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, if you perceive that there is an, a director that, you know, is normally heard by this chair or has some influence on the chair also, uh, bring a conversation with uh, this person. Another thing would be done is to invite some outsider to bring some concepts of you know, soft skills on boards and why, uh, why boards that do this way reach you know, uh, better decisions or better protected from you know, uh, not seeing what is happening and so on. Uh, and third, the board evaluation is the best instrument at, at the end for doing that when there is an individual evaluation or there is, you know, the, the chair evaluation. So you, you could, you know, point out uh, um, elements to, to the chair. And of course, when there is a problem, Constantino, the things is, are totally different. I mean, we, humanity, we learn by suffering, unfortunately. So if you have a situation where the company is facing a crisis, this could be a very good moment to talk outside the meeting with the chair and present things. He would never accept that in another situation. Mm -hmm. But in that situation, he will. And I'm, I'm telling you, I had this experience myself in a very, you know, deep crisis situation where many of the topics that I would include in the agenda that were impossible before became possible with, in, a, in a very, very tough crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent tips. And also trying like, to look for more recommendations. Nuno, would you like to ask to Sandra, please? Hi, Sandra. Uh, great to, to see your presentation. Very insightful. Uh, and my question is uh, relative to the allow time for uncertainty and avoid that uh, closure pressure, because there is, there is a little bit of a balance that you need between, yes, allowing time to, uh, to get some options, but at the same time, avoiding creating a never ending uh, search for the perfect solution, because we're in very fast times and sometimes the company itself needs to make very quick decisions uh, in order to change. So what's your recommendation to 
to create that balance uh, to have time, but also uh, have the ability to go and try maybe something new that we don't know enough. What, what would be your recommendation for that? Well, first of all, Nuno, thanks for your question. I think that uh, the decision process is part of the answer. So I, I, I like very much the approach of a pipeline. Consider the decision in a timeline, considering a pipeline of the decision. So if you're proposing as management to make an acquisition, for instance, uh, you should not expect and you should create a culture in your board that this is not a one board meeting topic, right? Because it's a huge, you know, location of capital is one of the elements that we should take care of and it's where we can lose a lot of money. So uh, the idea is that you create a culture and a process uh, that you, you know, this decision would come the proposition first with, you know, some some drivers of the decision, some elements uh, to, you know, a, a discussion of concepts, and then you're going to have the, you know, the work or the process. Uh, so you can have uh, these discussions in two or three meetings, depending on, uh, you know, the importance of uh, this uh, transaction, let's say. So this is one of the elements. The second element is that you can uh, use the committees, of course, to go in depth to certain elements of the discussions. And you, it's very difficult um, chairs that would use pools between board meetings. I did that when I, I was chairing a board. It was not, I mean, uh, it was not that the director would be committed to the response of that. It's a picture of that moment in time I would favor uh, more going to that direction. It's very, you know, broad the, the sense or to the other direction, or I need more information on this or that element. So this, you could, you know, uh, you could create a moment of this decision makers and in, in, in for feedback information from the position of uh, each one of the board meetings. And last, you can dedicate upfront a certain limit to this uncertainty. It could be 15 minutes, it could be 30 minutes, it could, it could be a full board meeting to focus on uncertainty using decision trees, using questions and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm in this soft skills programs, I'm implementing the use of a protocol it's, it's called Mediating uh, Access Protocol. It was created by uh, Daniel Kahneman and his co-authors in the latest book, which I recommend, Noise. It was launched May, it was launched last year. And there is this mediating uh, protocol that you know it's used particularly in a situation of MA where they propose. Uh, how the discussion should proceed in a, um, in a way to mitigate uh, noise, right? So uh, should you should you, you should consider locating a certain time for uncertainty, yeah. uh, and then you, you have the go of okay, we have to take a decision on that. So and even in the strategic planning process, I I I, I like pretty much the same approach. So you depart from the drivers of the strategic planning at that year. So what are the drivers? What are the elements at the top of our minds that you know we want to take care in this? This and and this phase should be very open to uncertainty, not certainty. At the end of the cycle of the strategic planning, then you reach uh, the the certainty and the closure. Yeah, and and thank you for that. Answer because I think that time boxing exercise is is very important in order to go and to make a decision because I had a, a an experience in which we went through five different board meetings with thirty six different approaches and at the end uh, we uh, the chairman decided to go and say I want one hundred percent certainty and it's like yeah we can either go spend four months more in order to get there 
uh, and or we go and we mitigate the risk. So it's that time boxing um, that I was thinking. So so thank you very much. And uh, perhaps, Alexander, we have literally right now just uh, four minutes because I know that you have a hard stop. And I just put the link uh, of, of the book from your editorial that is offering this uh, special discount. Uh, Cecile was there and she left, but with a question that I wanted like, to pass to you. And also the three or four questions that we have left, uh, I will send it to you and we are gonna share it in the article that we are gonna pass to all of our members, right? So the question from Cecile, how, uh, it was about like, how do you see the role of the committees versus the board as a whole? Well, it's a very important role where you get depth on the discussions of topics, but be aware that you are not delegating the decision of the board to the committee. And I see this quite, fr uh, quite frequently. So this topic of oh, the, the committee X, review this topic, okay, let's go. Uh, this is not what we want. We wanted the committees and go, uh, you know, uh, in further discussions, go in depth to the topics, make a proposition to the board, and then the board discusses the topic, particularly because the other, the, the, the ones that do not sit in that precise committee have to have their, you know, their understanding, their perception, their analysis, and then to reach a decision. But uh, committees are key to a good functioning of the board. And the leadership of the committees have to have the same characteristics that I was mentioning uh, uh, as the chair to do so. And the chair should be interacting with the, the head of the committees all the time to be sure that are everything connected. Excellent. Uh, we have like three more uh, questions. Perhaps I just take one because we are like a little bit like uh, under, under the time. So Francesco, if you are there, you were asking something about preparing materials. Yeah, well, just a simple question. According to your uh, experience, uh, Sandra, how much time uh, the senior executive team and uh, should spend uh, percentage-wise out of its total working time to prepare the reading material for the board meetings? I found myself spending as much as between 30 to 40% of my working time uh, essentially to prepare presentations for, for the board meetings. And, and, and the whole of the senior executive team came to the conclusion that we were not working very efficiently because of the workload imposed by the board. What is your opinion about this? It's, uh, thanks for the question, Francesco. It's very difficult to be prescript prescriptive on that because this time can vary uh, because of many, many different factors. Uh, what I think that, you know, I, I like to, uh, my approach to the pre-reading material, that instead of being this, this long and very careful prepared PowerPoints, you use a kind of a form, uh, you know, where you, you have a certain element that should be always present, and this should be agreed uh, board and management together, how could be this uh, proposition of uh, decision, decision proposition form. And, and you should put there those elements that are required to a certain level of decisions, right? Uh, and, you know, the PowerPoint thing that takes a lot of time from management should be, you know, as I said, two, three, five slides during the meeting only to set the scene. And the level of detail, uh, and this is a, an issue. I, I had board meetings with 700 pages. This is you know, impossible to digest. Uh, I mean, you can read it, but I'm talking about really analyzing and digest. So we're gonna, I, I'm, no, we're gonna use artificial intelligence to do this uh, more uh, efficiently in the future, but uh, the level of information has to be uh, the level of information required to the board to take this decision. And, and it has to be agreed between board and management. Currently, I'm working on a project with a board that I've been doing board evaluation for many years. And we are working together, board and management, to set up 
deforms the level of detail that is required to each of the decisions. So, uh, and this is done to be sure that the management use the time in a proper manner, not too much or not too less. And also, I see many times the same director going to three committees to cover the same topic. This is not a good use of management time. So when you have such a situation, you do, uh, you know, join meetings of the committee. So the executive is going to go one time to explore the topic with the two, three committees that have to be involved in this certain decision. I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a prescriptive uh, timing uh, because it varies a lot. And I, I've seen cases worse than yours, <laughs> Francesco. Excellent. Thank you, Sandra. Just like to, to, to close uh, now the meeting. Thank you very much to all of you. Those interested to connect with Sandra, please let me know and I will create the bridge. Sandra, excellent presentation. Have a beautiful weekend. Thank you again in name of VAB. Good afternoon, good uh, morning, and good night to Asia, Europe, Mexico, everywhere. Thank you very much to all of you for coming to our meeting. Thank you, everyone. It was very good experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Mm, bye. Thanks.